Good morning. This is Ramana and Krishnamurti. I'm the Chief Energy Officer at the University of Houston. Welcome to our Energy Symposium series, um, Creating a Sustainable Energy Transition. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, after that um, invigorating conversation at the TribFest uh, featuring Catherine Hayhoe, um, uh, Dr. Bullard, and Dr. Michael Weber, along with Aaron Douglas, um, a, a really a, a fascinating conversation there. Uh, today, um, we're going to take a slightly different um, take on this, uh, on this important topic. Uh, and uh, really, the, the, the focus of our conversation today is understanding how we address the energy trilemma. How do we address affordable, reliable, and environmentally sustainable energy uh, and ensuring as we do this, um, that we build back fair, we build back better. Um, and and uh, part of this is really uh, bringing together uh, groups from industry, academia, and government together as our panel represents today. It's my pleasure to welcome um, Jan Wilcox, Cindy Yielding, and Chuck McConnell, um, just going in reverse alphabetical order there, uh, but, um, to, to welcome them to this panel. Uh, Jen, now uh, would you like to just introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm actually currently the uh, acting assistant secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the Department of Energy. Um, I'm on leave as a professor of chemical engineering and energy policy at the University of Pennsylvania, and also formerly um, before January 20th and, and before stepping into this position, I was also leading the carbon dioxide removal program at the World Resources Institute, and just really excited to be part of the panel today. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for being here. We know how busy you are. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Cindy Yielding, who I've, who I've known for a long time. Uh, Cindy, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Ram. I really appreciate you including me on this uh, great panel. So I'm a geologist with 35 years of experience, all with BP, and I just retired last year. Part of my last role in BP was leading the working team to deliver the 2019 National Petroleum Council study on carbon capture use and storage. And you know, sort of that caught my heart. So now I'm primarily focused on supporting the Gulf Coast to become a global decarbonization hub through roles, including a board member at the Center for Houston's Future, non-exec director for Denbury, and through speaking and teaching about opportunities to decarbonize. Again, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Cindy. Real pleasure having you here. Uh, and uh, finally, my colleague, Chuck McConnell, um, the Executive Director for uh, our Carbon Management Center. Chuck? Thanks, Ram, and uh, I'll echo the sentiments. Uh, really delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, I've spent 35 years in the energy industry, uh, working for companies, Praxair, and, and later the Battelle Memorial Institute. I actually had the pleasure of serving for two years as the Assistant Secretary of Energy in the office of fossil that uh, that Jen is uh, is representing today, and, and certainly a, a well spent time for me in being involved with carbon management, even at an early stage some ten years ago. And of course, today uh, part of the University of Houston Center for Carbon Management, and also delighted to be uh, part of uh, of a consortia that we formed here in the Gulf Coast uh, for the broad commercial deployment of carbon capture, utilization, and storage with a representation of some 35 companies across the board under the umbrella of the Southern States Energy Board. So we're, we're excited to be a part of this. Well, Chuck, thank you so much. And thanks uh, to all the panelists for being here. I, you know, just a, a couple of things, I think, you know, just to level set and just to be sure everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, there have been th at least three pieces of information that have been rather sobering and, and sort of um, and uh, looking to see how we accelerate the energy transition. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the IPCC's sixth uh, assessment report that came out this summer. Uh, very clearly, the indications are uh, we have already warmed uh, the, the global temperatures by about 1.1 degrees um, Celsius from, um, from uh, pre-industrial times. Uh, and um, under all scenarios, uh, as we go forward, by 2040, uh, we will be one and a half degrees C 
about uh, that, that pre-industrial time um, temperatures, global temperatures. That is certainly uh, a very, very sobering piece of information because no matter what, we've locked in that. And as we go forward, do we go to a future that brings us back to about a degree or do we go to a future that takes us to about four to five degrees Celsius uh, temperature increase? And that's got huge consequences on what happens to the world. The second um, is something that came out of the IEA this summer. Again, they uh, essentially took, uh, took a pathway to net zero by 2050 uh, and identified that uh, clearly all of the actions that we are undertaking to address uh, the energy transition are, are, uh, are not going to set us on the pathway to just keeping global warming temperatures, global ch climate change and global temperatures to less than a degree and a half. And if we have uh, any aspiration to, uh, to uh, bring climate change under control, uh, we would have to completely transform our energy system. And, and add to that, I'll just add a third piece of data. And this is just asking the question, uh, if we just look at just anthropogenic CO2 uh, that, uh, that is being emitted, we are about between 38 and 40 gigatons a year. And if you ask the question, how much of it is being captured, used, or sequestered, it turns out to be less than half a percent, um, more like 0.1% uh, is, is a number that uh, people have bandied around, about 40 million tons a year. And that suggests to me that you know, this is, uh, whatever we do uh, with the energy transition has to accelerate. And so uh, let me open up this conversation uh, with you, Cindy, uh, to, to really you know, talk about you know, what's changed, um, what are the big opportunities that you see, and what are the big roadblocks? So, Ram, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, sort of how the landscape has changed for carbon capture use and storage, because I think that's something that, you know, sort of uh, available to us now as a, as a toolkit, uh, should we choose to, uh, to grow. So, there's finally been a convergence of need, of expertise, and supportive policies to capture carbon. And this has yielded sort of increasing buzz and building momentum. I think um, probably a lot of you guys have, have felt this. So actions by the U.S. Treasury Department and clarifying and strengthening the 45Q tax policies have really helped to reduce the risk and uncertainty for project developers. And we're moving from just talking to action. So that's super exciting. So I, I don't know if you wanted me to talk a little bit about the NPC study or you want to... Um, Cindy, go ahead, jump in uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the NPC study. I think that's really been one of the cornerstones over the last couple of years that's really transformed the way we think about this. Okay, so I kind of keeping it high level. Our, um, this is the National Petroleum Council for the U.S. Uh, and Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry at the time, uh, asked us to create a comprehensive understanding of what it would take to achieve carbon capture use and storage deployment at scale in the US and to provide a roadmap of how we might get there. So the study and the report we brought together key players from a range of industries, academia, NGOs, governments. So we had over 300 experts participate, including Jen and Chuck here on the panel. So our big takeaway from the study, this is doable. The technologies and some infrastructure exist. There's active government research and interest and their existing policies and regulations. It's, it's just, well, expensive. And there are still, as we talked about earlier, uh, just a few seconds ago, policy and regulatory uncertainties. So, but if we, if we get the big takeaways from the study, um, at scale deployment requires strong collaboration across a range of industries who don't always work together and government. Uh, we do have a need for improved policies, financial incentives, and clear regulations. And I would say there's been a lot of momentum in that direction at the federal and at state levels over this past year. Um, we do need to continue to innovate, uh, develop technology, invest in, in research. And we also need to make sure that stakeholders understand and have confidence in carbon capture use and storage. So U.S. is poised to move forward. Um, we have expertise and, let's say, for example, in the oil and gas industry, 
really well suited to move forward with these types of projects and growing regulatory and policy support to help catalyze this uh, industry in its infancy. Thanks so much, Cindy. Jen, you know, the, some, of, some of what Cindy mentioned, that really um, uh, policy and sort of the, the, the push that comes from um, the government side, the regulatory uh, support. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on, on how we move forward and what the big sort of uh, rock side to move forward? Sure. Um, yeah, building on what Cindy said, I mean, we do have 45Q. And I think the 45Q, the way that it's priced today, uh, is priced right for certain uh, sectors, the more concentrated streams of CO2, for instance. And the more concentrated the stream is, an exhaust stream of CO2, the easier it is to separate it, the more cost effective it is for separation. But the reality is, is that the majority of emissions from point source emitters, like the power sector, uh, they're more dilute than they are from, from, say, natural gas processing or even hydrogen production or bioethanol production today. And so because of that, we don't actually have a lot of projects today where the costs of separating from dilute streams like the exhaust of, of say, a, a natural gas fired power plant, those costs aren't quite transparent yet. And so at the Department of Energy, we have invested in front end engineering design studies uh, where we're looking at CCS on natural gas power plant exhausts. Uh, but we really need the funding to move forward with the demonstrations on these projects to make those costs transparent. Once we do that, once we can really make transparent those first of a kind costs, those costs will then inform 45Q so that the price will be right to make these approaches more economic today. And also, I'll, I'll add that a lot of the, the investments that we have made in the Department of Energy, and, and probably too, uh, when Chuck was in my position, is looking at CCS on coal. And we've learned a lot from those investments. And we're continuing to invest in some of these areas in a strategic way. But what we can do is we can take the data that we've learned from that. And a lot of the same chemical separation processes can be used for natural gas, can also be used for cement, can be used for steel production. And so we can leverage a lot of that learning in order to try and move forward through a broader portfolio that includes natural gas and also includes the industrial sector. And Jen, and Jen clearly one part of that must be uh, removing uh, CO2 from extremely dilute systems like air or the ocean. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely agree. Uh, so several years ago as a co-author, on a report that came out of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, specifically on carbon dioxide removal approaches. And it's become increasingly clear, climate models are showing that if we are to prevent, say, two degrees C warming, um, that we not only do we have to do deep decarbonization as fast and at the scale required in a, you know, quickly in an accelerated way, but it's no longer gonna be enough. Maybe a decade ago, avoiding carbon emissions would be enough. We're no longer in that position. We've simply waited too long. The, the small percentage that you talked about at the beginning of how much we're actually doing today is, is really insignificant compared to the, to the problem in meeting climate goals. And so now we have to be taking CO2 back out of the atmosphere. The legacy CO2 that's been accumulating in the atmosphere since the industrial revolution, we need to remove it. The good news is, is we know how to do it. We have technologies today that can do this. Um, you know, there's a, a number of different companies that are doing it, and it's not just chemicals, uh, which would be like uh, carbon engineering and Climeworks, you know, which actually just um, had a ribbon cutting last week in, in Iceland, where they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and injecting it deep underground um, through carb fix. But it's also about thinking about other strategies using minerals that are abundant in the Earth's crust, um, like calcium and magnesium that can react with CO2 in the atmosphere. Year. And often these are waste products from the mining industry. And so there's a lot of opportunities where we can actually clean up two wastes, CO2 and the waste that we have from mining. There's also other approaches that are more nature-based uh, approaches. You talked about the oceans as well. Um, but the issue is, is that we need to be very careful about the deployment of carbon dioxide removal. We should not see it as a way to keep going business as usual and be lazy about avoiding carbon emissions. And we have to also just recognize that the more concentrated the stream is of CO2, the more 
uh, easier it is to do the separation, the less inert gas like nitrogen that you have to process. And so it's going to be always easier to just avoid the carbon than to have to pull it back out. And so one of the things that we advocate, and I'll also mention, 40, a group of 40 authors published a book in January last year that's open access. It's called the CDR Primer and specifically talks about all of the different approaches to carbon removal, but also says we need to also be careful. Recognizing carbon removal is expensive. It's difficult. Some cases requires a lot of land low carbon energy, in some cases water. And so they have to be prioritized and we, and we should actually be thinking about in a regional way, how much decarbonization can we do today? Mm -hmm. Today, in the early days, what technologies are available to simply avoid it? And then thinking about what are the really, really difficult to avoid sectors? Like for instance, agriculture. Some, some modes of transportation like aviation, for instance, and shipping. And only in those cases should we really look at carbon dioxide removal as counterbalancing or offsetting and not to use it as an offset for emissions that we can avoid and have technologies to do so. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, Chuck, you know, this, uh, this sounds like uh, you know, the kinds of things that are going on right now um, in terms of, you know, when you start to think about what are the biggest challenges to moving forward today? Um, you know, you want to talk about what the issues are in terms of commercialization and and getting this um, deep decarbonization agenda moving. Yeah, uh, I'd like to build on comments that both Cindy and and Jen made. Um, you know, the NPC study clearly pointed out that in terms of broad commercialization the impact of hubs and clusters in terms of concentrated areas where emissions were prevalent and proximal geology existed for the safe and permanent storage of that CO2. Um, Jen mentioned how important it was to look at the cost of capture and that concentration of capture and the ability to actually use the business approach of hubs and clusters to leverage infrastructure, to be able to take advantage of the commercial advantages that one has in a concentrated area, such as the Gulf Coast here in Texas, or in other places around the world where large concentrations of oil and gas, petrochemicals, electric power, the cement industry, uh, you can go on and on. And all of these industries will not shut down overnight, they will require this kind of advanced technology and the application of it. And as we look at commercialization and really thoughtfully from a business standpoint, look at how to advance the deployment of this technology, it's gonna be really important to look at those, those infrastructural capabilities and the ability to put packages together, not just one-off demonstration projects, but to look at actually growing an ecosystem that embraces carbon capture and other decarbonization. And I think the other thing that has to be said here, and, and you can't walk away from it, there's a societal cost of carbon. It exists. We don't talk about it a lot. We don't have a carbon tax. We often don't address it head on. And I think some of the transparency issues that, that Jen referred to, very critical here. We have to embrace the fact that we're doing something for the good of society. It's going to cost consumers and all of us. So there's no free ride here. And the businesses and the industries that are a part of this will be investing. But let's not forget, they've got shareholders and people that are part of their ecosystem as well. So we're all in this together. And certainly the governmental support the support from universities and places where, where we are, Ron, but also the industrial community, everybody's in this together. And, uh, and that's really where the commercialization aspects are going to come. It's not one burden for one entity, but it's a societal burden that we're all going to have to address. I think, you know, Chuck, you, you really hit the nail on the head there with you know, talking about it as a societal burden. So who picks up the cost? What are, what are the challenges associated? None of this is a free, not, there is not, no such thing as a free lunch. And in the case of carbon, that's pretty clear in, the, in terms of the energy transition. That's pretty clear. So who picks up the burden? Where do we go forward? How do we go forward? 
Well, I, I'll, I'll give you my two cents and, and for what it's worth. I think as people, as consumers, as we all exist in society, we look at the behaviors of people in terms of how important issues are. Are we willing to pay extra? Are we willing to make those kinds of sacrifices? I would argue often we are not. What we look to is the magic of technology for the magical solution. And I think that's where the burden falls here to come up with these technological advances, because I don't believe people will sacrifice as a natural behavior. I don't see that in, in, in many areas of our, of our world, okay? But I think the other thing that's important is, is we look at the global community that we're in and the expectation of decarbonization, the ability to produce goods and services that are decarbonized, that have an advantage in a global market to be an advantaged product, that's part of the commercial roadmap as well. And it's not to be ignored is that we have an opportunity, I think, as we lead in technology to also lead in that ability to participate in a global market in a different way than we've ever before. And I think it's it's the opportunity that's in front of us. So, Jen, clearly, you know, I think this was um, a, a direct place for you know, where does government come in with a very visible hand to, to start to change this? And if so, in what directions does it go? Well, one thing I'll I'll just add, I can I can hopefully weave that into my to my feedback here. Um, but one thing I think that's important to recognize that's changed and that's happening right now and just more recently over the last couple of years is the private sector and all of the net zero goals that corporates are making. And this has been really exciting. And when you look at their net zero goals, there's different scopes of emissions, right? There's the scope one where you absolutely have control. You know, you have behaviors, you have um, things that you can do that simply avoid the emissions in the first place. And then you have indirect emissions. You know, maybe you can't control the electricity, you know, and the grid and, and how you access that. And, and even further, you can't, if you have a, you know, if you're a corporate and you have a cafe and you have food that you serve, how do you decarbonize the agricultural sector? You know, that's not something that's in your control. If you have folks that are taking, um, you know, flights, how do you decarbonize the aviation sector? Uh, and so, and if you're building infrastructure, how do you decarbonize the steel? How do you decarbonize the cement and the concrete you don't have control over? And so what you see is a lot of these corporates in order to address their indirect emissions are actually trying to purchase robust carbon dioxide removal offsets today that don't exist. And so some of what we're trying to do at the Department of Energy is to make more transparent. I know before I started, I didn't have awareness of all the investments that DOE was making um, across these different sectors. And you know, you go on the website, it's not easy to find. We're trying to make this more transparent. And so it's very much public. You know, the front end engineering design studies, which is the first step, that's the first step of in terms of investing before you go to a demonstration scale or a pilot scale. And so making clear, like right now, we have a feed study where we're looking at carbon capture on a steel plant in Indiana. Now, ultimately, if we can move forward with demonstrating that and actually making that project go forward, that's going to be a low you know, that's going to be a low steel supply chain that is going to be available. Now, companies that are having to purchase carbon removal offsets for more than $100 a ton, by the way, in a voluntary way today, again, for offsetting emissions that we can simply avoid through advancing these technologies and making them commercial. You know, so, so it's like what we're trying to do is just really be transparent about the projects that we're investing in in an early stage, technologies that work, that it's not, you know, some pie in the sky that we need some new, uh, you know, uh, technology to invent. This isn't rocket science. It actually works and we have access to it today is that we need to get it to scale. And we only have funding for like the first of a kind project. And so that transparency is going to be critical. We also have a couple of feed studies on decarbonizing cement. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so that could also be an opportunity where you see this supply chain. And we're also trying to look at government procurement of low carbon supplies. And it's not just cement and steel, but what about fuels? You know, this is a really important area. Uh, and so some of the work we're doing is looking at synthetic fuels. We have to manage so much carbon dioxide, putting it deep underground. That's one option. But another option is using it as a feedstock, you know, for synthetic fuels with clean hydrogen. And so all of these different approaches and increasing our transparency, I think, can actually help to drive some of that that private sector. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not the solution that we need to get to the numbers of, of gigatons, but at least kind of gets the ball rolling. It moves us down the cost curve. And also, again, that transparency to inform policy so that it's priced right, something like 45Q or a low carbon fuel standard like California has to help offset future projects. So that's some of some of what we're seeing. Well, uh, you know, you, you, you hit on something that's very important, this issue of transparency. And Cindy, you know, one of the challenges for the industry as it starts to move forward is really being transparent about uh, those emissions as well as how they mitigate those emissions. Um, scope one, scope two, clearly much more addressable. Scope three, uh, that's that's where the transparency issues come, come, come in uh, to become important. What are your thoughts about that? How does industry challenge challenge that? Well, I to me, the sort of fundamental opportunity here is to just start moving into action. Um, I think we'll learn along the way. And you know, I think we've been kind of paralyzed, you know, obviously for economics, but you know, just sort of uh, like, well, we haven't done a lot of this before, so there's operational risk. And I think we also need to acknowledge that, you know, there's always risk in growing a new industry. That's balanced by these great societal and environmental risks if we don't move forward. So I think we need to keep talking. We need to keep learning. We need to be very, very open and transparent. We need to move into action, start operating, grow our skills and expertise, grow the infrastructure, grow the market. Um, we, we've all mentioned, you know, collaboration and we need to be, you know, working together in ways that maybe we haven't before. And um, we need trust. We need to uh, engage in sort of uh, engage with actual external monitoring and verification, engaging stakeholders and really establish this common goal to safely reduce carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I think where there's knowledge you can build that trust, and that will help us move forward with you know, scope one, scope two, as John described, emissions, but also understanding everybody's impact on the, the broader atmosphere. Yeah, and you know, I think you, you mentioned it's time for action, and it sounds like uh, you know, Texas could be a, a central piece to this action item. Uh, the recent announcement that ExxonMobil made, along with uh, 10 other companies, uh, Chevron, Lion, Dell, Ineos, uh, and, and the whole range of them in the, in the Gulf Coast region. What are your thoughts about you know, Texas being a leader in this area? Do you think we've got the right, right uh, talent pool, the right uh, opportunity to do this? Oh, yeah. So, so Texas, you know, kind of what do we offer? First of all, we've got a challenge. But Texas is a huge emitter. Emissions from our coal and gas power plants industry, including chemicals refining and steel manufacturing, make us the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the U.S. and one of the largest in the world. But we've also got fantastic opportunities, right? We've got great rocks. Remember, I'm a geologist. Um, great rocks for carbon storage. There's a huge amount of subsurface pore space in Texas, much of it concentrated along the Gulf Coast near the emitters. Um, that includes a limited number of existing oil fields that could store CO2 through enhanced oil recovery and an almost unlimited amount of saline or wet reservoirs, both onshore and offshore, which could store CO2. There's an existing pipeline transportation network for CO2, which could be built upon and added to rather than uh, started from scratch. And most importantly, we've got expertise. So many of the skills required for carbon capture are concentrated here. Expertise in the power sector, and in oil and gas, and we've got fantastic institutions like U of H, Rice, and UT, some fantastic work by Bureau of Economic Geology. So this creates jobs at a whole new 
industry. Um, you know, general no, I used to always go, you know, this could be a trillion dollar industry. And a lot of the my NBC colleagues would laugh at me. And now they're the same ones, you know, saying, yeah, that's true. That's absolutely mm-hmm. true. So um, multi-trillion dollar industry. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so anyway, I, I think we've got a great opportunity. And, you know, I, as a native Texan, I always like to say this is a place where we can get her done. So we've got a big problem. It offers even bigger opportunities. You know, Cindy, if I could jump in on what you just said, you know, often people say, what's the cart and what's the horse with policy and technology? And I would argue that it's clear to me that policy has to incentivize these investments. You can't get around that. You can't head fake your way through this. We have and can see globally places like Teesside in the UK and Rotterdam over in Europe, where governments are stepping in and putting some serious money in play to catalyze the industry. You referenced 45Q. And we looked at it during the NPC study, and it is a wonderful start, but it is not sufficient. It's not going to get us there. And if we are serious about this, we must look at these policy drivers because the technology, as you mentioned, the workforce, the capabilities, we've got good people, infrastructure, everything you mentioned. But if we don't have the policy framework to support this, We're going to be talking about this a year from now in a panel just like this. Right. And here's the real key. If we don't start getting her done here in Texas, the rest of the world isn't going to be able to take advantage of everything that we've accomplished. And frankly, if we solve the problem in the U.S., that's wildly insufficient to the tonnages of CO2 that Jen mentioned. The real key here is how do you get global deployment of commercial technologies to the places in the world where all the CO2 is being admitted? We're less than 10 percent of the story here in the U.S. So we've got to get this acceleration going for not just ourselves, but also for the rest of the world. But I think, and this is where I like to have Jen come in and talk a little bit about this. Right, We've had a lot of energy uh, and you know, Houston seen as the energy capital of the world. But that energy also brings with it some challenges. Uh, and is this an opportunity to do something different? Uh, first, I'll say, you know, when you look at I, I fully agree with what uh, Cindy and Chuck are saying, the you know, the assets that exist in this region um, can be leveraged. You know, it's a reversal flow of carbon back in the ground, deep underground, and also thinking about refineries of the future, like I said before, too. You know, another way to manage CO2 is is turn it into synthetic fuels with clean hydrogen. And so there's just a lot of opportunity uh, with the existing infrastructure, skill set, preservation of jobs, creation of new jobs uh, in this region. Um, and And I think that there's just a lot of opportunity. The other piece I'll say, though, is that the way that 45Q is priced today is it's it's not it's not priced right for some of the more dilute streams that we're talking about. So when you look at the, you know, the portfolio of emitters in the region, and when you look at say natural gas fired power plants, the concentration is between three and five percent CO2. If you look at, for instance, a cement plant, it can be upwards to 25% CO2. And even when you know you look at 45Q, it's not quite priced right for first-of-a-kind plants on the concentrated streams. And that's why we can, in the early days, leverage the private sector. Some of these companies willing to lean in, knowing that they're investing now for higher value later. Um, and, and But the less concentrated streams, we really need to get these demonstrations going so that we can inform 45Q and get the price right. And the other piece is, is that these projects are financed over, you know, 10 to 20 years. And so there needs to be reliability in terms of long-term support for projects, not temporary, not 10 years, um, not 12 years. And so you need, there needs to be more durability in the duration of the tax credit as well. Um, another piece that I'll, I'll also mention, I think is important is Chuck had mentioned the international piece, the global piece. Absolutely. You know, we are just one piece of the story, right? And it's and it's really net zero global is what's going to really help climate. And so one thing that we can see is we can be a leader. We have the opportunity with the region, with the good rocks that Cindy's talking about in the region, you know, in Texas, um, 
we have absolutely the opportunity, the expertise, the ingenuity, the skill set, the labor force to be leading in this space, moving down the cost curve. And then what that means is the cost can be there and right and economic for the other countries that don't have to kind of take these risks first. And so I think that a lot of this technology that we can advance here in the U.S. can be leveraged internationally so that we can kind of pave the way for other regions to, to follow our path. Um, and I think your original uh, question, Ram, was really about two When we think about these projects on the ground, when we think about demonstration, um, and siting of projects. Right now, we're looking at just the fact that there's all this infrastructure and there's the geology and all these, and there's the emitters, and it all just aligns quite well. That doesn't exist everywhere, right? And we need to do it in more than just Texas. We have lots of places in the United States where we can think about this. It's just not quite as far along. Uh, and I think that the the piece that is important to mention and something that we're very much uh, leaning in on in this administration is public engagement and making sure that when we do demonstration scale projects, we don't want to do them just for these four years. We don't want to do them for 10 years. They need to be long term through mid-century, which means we need we need public and stakeholder support for projects in order for them to be sustainable. And we need to make sure that the frontline communities are part of the discussions and understanding what their concerns are, because there is some mistrust, of course, you know, uh, with, with the fossil sector. And so we want to make sure that we are listening and that we hear, you know, what are the concerns? Is it about clean water? Is it access to energy? Is it about jobs? Is it about air pollution? Just have, you know, making sure that we have empathy, that we're listening and that we can actually communicate effectively how these investments are leading to benefits to communities and, and addressing some of those legacy concerns. And so that's going to be an important piece. And, and the reality is, is it's not a blanket solution because every region has a different set of concerns. And so we need to be able to do that engagement in the various regions. Uh, and that's going to be an important piece for success. And, and you, know, you touched on something that I thought was very, very important. It's, it was about jobs and and the workforce side. And all three of you have engaged in the higher education side of things. Do we have the right workforce? What do we do to get them re ready? Anybody wants to take it on? <laughs> Jen, you probably, you probably well, we, we certainly lighter. have, Cindy mentioned it, we certainly have a skilled workforce today. Well-educated, people are in jobs and they've been performing them quite well. It's a great industry, but it's an industry that's in transition. People need to be able to pivot in the kinds of jobs that they're doing today into the energy transition space. Uh, I would argue for those in the fossil industry, the hydrocarbon industry, it's not about laying a bunch of people off so they can go somewhere else and make solar panels. But in fact, being involved with pivoting within your own industry to do these kinds of decarbonization technologies that are new, that are challenging, are going to require those new skills and capabilities. We've got to be able to work with that part of the workforce, as well as getting our students prepared for these energy transitions that they're going to move into. This is a whole new world that will require these kinds of skills. And I, I think as we embrace that and we see that, it's about the transition of the workforce, not necessarily moving people in and out of different places, but in fact, making them more capable in the jobs and in the communities that they're in today. Jen, you want to, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I also think, yeah, I fully agree, uh, you know, and I, I, that the industry you know, today associated with state oil and gas and even the mining industry, when you think about coal mining, there's a lot of opportunities to map those jobs exactly to where we need to be to align with net zero carbon emissions goals. Um, but the one thing that I would add is that we do, we could use uh, more social science. You know, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about as geologists, geophysicists, chemical engineers, um, 
But to be honest, you know, when I first started in this administration, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in things like environmental justice, right? And so I'm learning um, all of these terms and, and I'm also learning about public engagement. Uh, and I think that, you know, bringing in social science, um, ethics, um, philosophy, even these are really important topics and important skill sets uh, that haven't been part of the conversation, have not been part of the solution to the extent that they could be. And I'll just give an example. Uh, so when we think about deployment or when we think about the demonstration scale side of things of a project in a given region, and you first explore the community in that region and you want to translate investments to benefits, um, you have to first understand what the legacy impacts have been in that community. And there are oftentimes in these investments, there's an opportunity to restore the environment at the same time that you're deploying something new. And so this restorative justice concept will also help to build trust in communities. And so, but, it, but it's very, um, you know, it's just not a skill set that engineers are equipped with, that geophysicists are equipped with. So I think, you know, bringing that kind of skill set into the conversation is really imperative. And it's something that we're excited about too. And we're working in the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management on a new program where we're actually thinking, you know, bringing in some of these voices, which will be exciting. Yeah, and that's, that's the kind of thing that I think future generations are looking to. I can speak for Cindy and as well as for myself. Our, our kids are in college and I think this, these are ways to get them excited. What do you think, Cindy? Absolutely. You know, I, I, um, I love what Chuck said about, you know, we can transition our, our industry. And I think um, Jen is exactly right on the social science. But I was going to say, you know, there's some really exciting aspects um, that just just to add to the conversation, certainly continuing digitalization and growth in um, in those skill sets in you know, in the data sciences are going to be really critical. And those are attractive to our kids. And also just the technology development. Um, I would say that the DOE has done a heroic job of investing and testing um, new technologies. Um, and there is a lot of universities in really, really thriving startup community. We can't let that drop just because we are moving forward, hopefully, with existing technology. Let's continue to invest, explore, and research uh, all sorts of ways to, uh, to remove carbon, to get uh, to, into deep decarbonization, because we're going to need a really broad toolkit to do this with fresh minds as well as the established workforce. Yeah, we got we got to make sure that everybody floats, right? Nobody can can go under, and that's part of the story with the whole carbon story and climate change. Is it's only as good as the weakest link, and and I think that's part of where we where we're going to start moving forward. We've got a bunch of questions from the from our audience, but in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip to our closing remarks here and uh, sort of invite Jen to start off if you've got some thoughts. Uh, as you leave the panel today. I really appreciate what you've shared with us, but if you've got some closing thoughts, that'd be great. Sure, thanks again for having me. Um, what I would say in closing is that just really, you know, asking the broader audience to have an open mind and be thinking about these types of, um, you know, thinking about carbon management more broadly in, in a systems way. And the hubs and clusters uh, approach is going to be a way for us to kind of accelerate impact in this space, but also net zero, recognizing that net zero is a pretty simple equation. It means that for every carbon we put out in the atmosphere, we got to take back out. And so there's going to be a role that carbon dioxide removal will play. But in terms of kind of systems-based thinking, hubs and clusters, um, every region has resources that it can offer to this equation. You know, whether it's waste biomass to wonderful geology in the earth, leveraging existing infrastructure to move it forward. Uh, there's just so many of these things. And, and really just, we need to call on regions to be thinking about what are their skill set, What is the existing infrastructure that they can just leverage to be part of the solution? Not just to avoiding carbon, but also the carbon removal for the sectors that are really hard to avoid today. But in terms of prioritizing 
facing all across in terms of the resources required for deep decarbonization and prioritizing that first and foremost, and the resources that will remain in order to take the carbon back out. Thanks so much, Jan. Uh, Cindy? So I'd say we're getting started. Let's not lose momentum. Let's keep going. Uh, collaboratively, um, trust trusting each other while monitoring and just keep moving, get her done in Texas, in the U.S. and globally, because it's what we all need. Chuck, your thoughts? Well, there's no doubt about it. It's an existential issue for us all. And I don't want to sound like Debbie Downer here, but I will tell you my biggest concern continues to be that the consumers, the societal people that are clamoring for these changes, I question fundamental whether we are really ready to make those sacrifices, those investments. Next time you go to McDonald's, check out how many people are sitting in a drive through line, texting on their on their phone seven deep in line while they're idling their car and yet claim to be concerned about the environment. And so I think in terms of this whole process, we have an educational component here that the societal cost of carbon needs to be addressed. It needs to be embraced and understood. And as we make decisions, commercial decisions to move forward, it's more critical than ever that we think about impact and relevance each time we make these investment decisions. We can't go chasing moonbeams and sunshine to do a little bit here or there. We have to look at where the big impacts can happen and make those investments first, really to, to Cindy's point about getting the ball moving. Let's go where it matters and make an impact. Well, Chuck, Cindy, Jen, thank you so much for spending the last 45 minutes with me uh, in, in this conversation. It's been enlightening. I think uh, you know the take home message is, um, we can get this done. We can get this done and be a global leader. And we've got the right people, the right environment to get it done. But we've got to be very intentional about how we do it. And I think that's a message that I think we can all resonate with. And I certainly want to thank each of you for taking the time uh, to be a part of this uh, and look forward to seeing you also. Thank you.